What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Illumination Hour. This is me, your host, Ellen. And this week, we are going to be talking about something that I think plagues everyone on this planet. Unless you're some sort of magical genius and you can control everything that happens in your brain, which on some level... I would say we can. We can control our conscious processes to some degree. And that depends on a lot of things like emotional intelligence and willpower. But there are things that happen in your brain that you cannot control. And that is what we call the subconscious. Now that brings about things like dreams or urges or fantasies and sometimes sometimes it seeps its way into our consciousness without us even really knowing how it got there or where it came from. So today I'm going to be talking about something called the white bear phenomena and I know that most of you probably don't know what I'm talking about right now but Hopefully, this will become clear to you once I start talking about it. Everyone knows what it's like to have unwanted thoughts, right? Thoughts like, I'm not good enough, or I'm fat, or no one likes me. Or sometimes these thoughts are directed towards other people, but regardless, they're memories, sayings, things that you just can't seem to get out of your head. And It's not something that you are controlling consciously. So we're going to be reading a bit about unwanted thoughts, and we'll see how this ties into the white bear phenomena that I mentioned. Unwanted thoughts. They're enough to crush your daily life and make you feel completely out of control. When you can't control your own thoughts, you feel insane. Crazy thoughts. Shameful thoughts obsessive thoughts. Thoughts that appear from nowhere. You know what I mean. Those kinds of thoughts. It's different for everyone. You may think bad and extreme things that you really don't want to think. Or you may obsess about the future. Maybe it's about washing your hands. You might perform little rituals at certain points until you feel just right. You might check, check, and recheck things. Or you might worry about losing something. You might fear that you are going insane. Literally losing your mind. Whatever it is, you may feel desperate because you can't control your own thoughts. Well, these days, there's a term for being unable to control your thoughts. It's what psychologists call the white bear syndrome. The white bear syndrome is related to something called ironic process theory, which refers to the psychological process whereby deliberate attempts to suppress certain thoughts make them more likely to surface. Now, how does that make sense? Well, an example is how... When someone is actively trying to not think of a white bear, they may actually be more likely to imagine one. So where does this name, the white bear syndrome, come from? Well, some of you may know the author Fyodor Dostoevsky. He was a Russian author. He wrote several wonderful books, including Crime and Punishment and The Brothers Karamazov. He was quoted as saying this, Try to pose for yourself this task, not to think of a polar bear, 
and you will see the cursed thing come to mind every minute. This observation comes from Dostoevsky's Winter Notes on Summer Impressions. It's an 1863 account of his travels in Western Europe. So back to the white bear phenomena. It was identified through thought suppression studies in experimental psychology. Social psychologist Daniel Wegner first studied ironic process theory in a laboratory setting in 1987. So this is quite recent. It wasn't until recently in our history that we began paying attention to thought processes such as this. Ironic mental processes have been shown in a variety of situations where they're usually created or worsened by stress. In extreme cases, ironic mental processes result in intrusive thoughts about doing something immoral or out of character, which can be troubling to the individual. These findings have since guided clinical practice. For example, they show why it would be unproductive to try to suppress anxiety-producing or depressing thoughts. So I'll give you an example of some of the experiments that were tried and that actually helped us to understand this ironic process theory. The experience sampling or daily diary method is one way that psychologists attempt to specifically and scientifically measure thoughts. This involves interrupting people as they go about their daily lives and asking them to record the thoughts they are having right at that moment, in that place, often by using something called clickers. One research team at Ohio State University tried to figure out how often people think about sex by using so-called clickers, asking the 283 college students to click each time they thought about sex, food, or sleep. There were three different groups of students, and I'm guessing each one of them had one of these topics. Anyway, the study found that on average, men had 19 thoughts about sex per day, whereas the highest was 388 times per day. And women thought about sex only 10 times per day. Among the study's flaws were that the researchers had not taken ironic process theory into their experimental design. Students were just given clickers by researchers and asked to record when they thought about sex or food or sleep. Imagine them walking away from the psychology department, holding the clicker in their hand, trying not to think about sex all the time, yet also trying hard to remember to press the clicker every time they did think about it. That could be a little confusing, and maybe you can see how that would affect the experimental results. Ironic process theory proposed two opposing mechanisms, or a dual process theory. First, monitoring processes unconsciously, and automatically monitoring for occurrences of the unwanted thought. Calling upon the second, conscious operating processes, if the thought occurs. This theory explains the effects of increased cognitive load by emphasizing that where there is cognitive effort, the monitoring process may supplant the conscious process, also suggesting that in order for thought suppression to be effective, a balance between the two processes must be met, with the cognitive demand not being so great as to let the monitoring processes interrupt the conscious ones. Cognitive overload inhibits successful activation of operating processes. Such overload has been shown to occur experimentally when individuals attempt to aggressively suppress intrusive thoughts by distracting themselves, either by focusing on different environmental objects or thinking about anything but the thought in question. Overload is also believed to occur in daily life as a result of mental pressures, anxiety, stresses, and so forth. The monitoring process serving to alert the individual to an unwanted thought about to become salient and intrude on his or her consciousness, continues to find instances of the unwanted thought creating a state of hyper-accessibility, unchecked by controlled thought processes. Research has also shown that individuals do have a capacity to successfully suppress thoughts, 
by focusing on specifically prepared distractions or objects, a process sometimes referred to as focused distraction. So, ironic process theory, or the white bear syndrome, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but at the same time, I think we all understand how it works. The more you tell yourself not to think about something, the more you can't help but think about it. So, for example, when I was in high school, back when I first entered high school in 2008, there was something that I was introduced to that was one of these white bears. This is called the game. So the game is basically a mental activity that has to be played with other people. So what happens is when you think of the game, you have to shout out, I lost the game! And then hopefully everybody else that's playing the game around you will then think about the game and lose it and shout out, I lost the game! So it's like a chain reaction. The more people that say the game, the more people think about it, the more people lose it. And then you forget about the game right afterwards, hopefully. Uh, and then sometime down the road, you think about the game again. Whether it's just in passing, you think about Monopoly. Monopoly is a game. Oh, the game. That's right. I lost it. Just knowing that there's something that you cannot think about or should not think about makes you want to think about it even more. It's like the mental forbidden fruit. Let's read a little bit more into some of Wagner's studies in this psychological process. Wagner is a psychology professor at Harvard University, and he's also the founding father of this thought suppression research. And he first came across the quote by Dostoevsky about the white bear more than 25 years ago. I was really taken with it, he said. It seems so true. He decided to test the quote's assumption with a simple experiment. He asked participants to verbalize their stream of consciousness for five minutes while trying not to think of a polar bear. If this white bear did come to mind, he told them, they should ring a bell. Despite the explicit instructions to avoid it, the participants thought of a white bear more than once per minute on average. Next, Wegner asked the participants to do the same exercise, but this time to try to think of a white bear. At that point, the participants thought about a white bear even more often than a different group of participants who had been told from the beginning to think of white bears. So, I know that sounds a little confusing. There's two groups of people. The first group is told, don't think about white bears. Okay, now you can think about white bears. The results suggested that suppressing the thought for the first five minutes caused it to rebound even more prominently in the participants' minds later on. So the group that was told not to think about white bears and then allowed to thought about them way more than the people who were told, go ahead and think about white bears from the very beginning. This research, published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology in 1987, initiated an entirely new field of study on thought suppression. Over the next decade, Wegner developed his theory of ironic process to explain why it is so hard to tamp down unwanted thoughts. He found evidence that when we try not to think of something, one part of our mind does avoid the forbidden thought, but the other part checks in every so often to make sure the thought is not coming up, therefore, ironically, bringing it to mind. It's like we all have two competing parts in our brain, one that's like, I'm being a good boy, I'm not thinking about anything I shouldn't be, and the other saying, hey, hey, what about this thing, this thing that you're not supposed to be thinking about, hey, did you think about it yet? After more than a quarter century of this research, Wegner said he's realized that when he explains his work, listeners usually follow up with one question. Okay, so what do I do about this? Is there really any way to avoid unwanted thoughts? The topic rings true for many people, perhaps especially because the thoughts that we often want to avoid are not as innocuous as white bears. They might involve painful memories or other difficult distractions. In his ABA presentation, Wegner described several strategies that he and others have come across to help suppress the white bears. They include pick an absorbing distraction and focus on that instead. 
In one study, Wagner and his colleagues asked participants to think of a red Volkswagen instead of a white bear. They found that giving the participants something else to focus on helped them to avoid the unwanted white bears. Try to postpone the thought. Some research has found that asking people to simply set aside half an hour a day for worrying allows them to avoid worrying during the rest of the day. So next time any unwanted thought comes up, he suggested, just try to tell yourself, I'm not going to think about that until next Wednesday. Cut back on multitasking. One study found that people under increased mental load show an increase in the availability of thoughts of death. One of the great unwanted thoughts for most people. Death is your only escape. Die. So apparently multitasking and doing too many things at once can make you have such negative thoughts as death. That doesn't sound good. I guess the point there is don't stress yourself out too much. A couple other things he suggests. Exposure. This is painful, Wagner said, but it can work. If you allow yourself to think in controlled ways of the thing that you want to avoid, then it will be less likely to pop back into your thoughts at other times. Meditation and mindfulness. There is evidence that these practices, which strengthen mental control, may help people avoid unwanted thoughts. I think my favorite suggestion that he has made so far is that of exposure. I find that often it is very true that you cannot avoid your problems. You cannot avoid things that you don't want to think about or don't want to realize are there. You have to face them and allow yourself to come to terms with them. You have to expose yourself to the unpleasant things that sometimes you don't want to. So that way, in the future, it won't be such a big hurdle for you. It's like getting a vaccine. You're injected with a form of the virus that is not that deadly, but it gives you enough exposure that you're familiar with it so that next time you actually face the full strength virus, it doesn't have such a detrimental effect on you. So I know this sounds a little bit frightening, this white bear effect, but I'm going to be reading to you an article that explains to you why you should feel what you feel, but not believe everything that you think. What I'm trying to get you to take away from this is that sometimes it's okay to think about things that you don't want to think about, but don't believe it. What do I mean by that? I'll explain it to you using this article. This article's on endoherdy.com. I recently finished a fascinating book called The Willpower Instinct by Kelly McGonigal. Below, I share a few studies mentioned in the book and the key takeaways from them. Definitely give this a read if you struggle with willpower. He mentions the white bear syndrome, and he says from he says about this, trying not to think about something guarantees that it is never far from your mind. Well, what if people think you're weird? Felipe Golden is a neuroscientist who studies depression and anxiety at Stanford University. The people who enroll in his studies suffer from severe social anxiety and self-doubt. Oh, sounds kind of like me. <laughs> Before and after some coaching, Golden puts each test subject in an fMRI machine so that he can measure their brain activity. While in the machine, he flashes up several statements on a screen and asks the participants to reflect on them. Statements such as, I'm not okay with the way I am. People think I'm weird. Something is wrong with me. Between sessions in the fMRI machine, Golden teaches each participant to observe and accept their thoughts and feelings no matter how scary or uncomfortable they may be. This is a big change from the suppression techniques social anxiety sufferers normally use to deal with challenging thoughts. Golden encourages them not to push the scary thoughts away, teaching them instead how to handle such thoughts and develop confidence that the anxiety will naturally run its course if they don't resist it. The brain activity of each participant in Golden Studies is drastically different before and after the coaching. The fMRI machine shows that 
When someone pays more attention to the self-critical statements appearing on screen in front of them, there is much less activity in the stress center of their brain. So what can we learn from this? Whatever fear or desire you try to push away will become more convincing and compelling. It's much better to just accept your thoughts, face them, think about them, process them, and then let them go. Ooh, here's a good one. Would you like some chocolate? James Erskine is a psychologist at St. George's University of London who once ran an experiment involving self-control and chocolate, which when it comes to chocolate, I really have no self-control. A few dozen women were invited to the lab for a taste test of two similar chocolate treats. Before the test began, each woman was asked to think aloud for five minutes. A third of the women were given no special instructions about what to think. Another third were told that they could express any thought they had about chocolate, while the final third were instructed to suppress any thoughts about chocolate. After each participant was done thinking out loud and the chocolates were brought in, they were left alone in the room with a survey and told to eat as many chocolates as necessary to answer the questions, which in my case would have been all of them. So who ate the most chocolates? By far, it was the woman who had tried not to think about chocolates before the test. On average, they ate almost twice as many as the other study participants, and those of them who claimed to be dieting ended up eating the most chocolates of all. No surprise there. So, what can we take away from this one? Trying to avoid unwanted feelings often leads to self-destructive behavior. Whether it's a procrastinator trying to avoid anxiety, or a drinker trying to avoid feeling alone. No kisses for you. 100 students were each given a transparent box of Hershey's Kisses to keep them at all times for 48 hours and told not to eat a single one or any other chocolate for that matter. Oh my goodness, that's so cruel. No chocolate for 48 hours. What what were these people thinking? Before the experiment began, each student was given some coaching on how to handle any chocolate cravings they might experience. Half of them were told to try distracting themselves from their cravings and suppress whatever thoughts they had of eating chocolate. The other half got a lesson in the white bear phenomena. They were instructed to notice when they were having cravings and to accept whatever thought and feeling came up, while keeping in mind that they don't have to act on those thoughts and feelings. The results of the experiment were remarkable. Not only did the students who gave up thought control not eat a single chocolate between them throughout the 48 hours, but they also reported feeling less stressed during the experiment and experiencing less cravings for chocolate. What can we learn from this one? When you stop trying to control unwanted thoughts and emotions, they stop controlling you. What can we learn from all of these studies together? Here's a couple good takeaways from this. Surf the urge. This is the name the author McGonagall gives to the process of accepting a craving or impulse. Rather than trying to resist an urge, it's much more effective to surf it like a wave. You take notice of the physical sensation in your body and remind yourself that you don't have to act on them. McGonagall warns that surfing the urge does take practice, and you can expect to fall off the board a few times in the beginning. But over time, you learn how to accept and handle all your difficult inner experiences, and no longer need to turn to unhealthy rewards for comfort. Also, feel what you feel, but don't believe everything you think. The idea here is that we can never really control what thoughts enter our head. But we tend to start believing a thought when it plays over and over and over again in our minds.
especially if it's a thought we've tried to get rid of. This mental phenomenon is what advertisers prey on, knowing that if we're exposed to a specific message enough times, we'll start to believe it. This message is brought to you by Coca-Cola. The way out is to let go. That is, stop trying to control your negative or troubling thoughts. Instead, just notice how such thoughts feel in your body. Then shift your attention to your breath and let them fade away. The willingness to think what you think and feel what you feel without necessarily believing that it is true and without feeling compelled to act on it is an effective strategy for treating anxiety, depression, food cravings, and addiction. You can't argue with that, can you? So those are some very good pieces of advice. Just recognize what you're feeling, accept it, and move on. You don't have to act on these things that you're thinking. Also, it seems like the framework with which you look at a situation can change dramatically how you think and feel about it in the future. When it comes to simple things like, you know, not not worrying about your house every day when you leave, that's simple enough. There are plenty of things to distract you from that. But again, sometimes we have memories or experiences that have much more dangerous and traumatic thoughts attached to it, and we can't always block those out. Sometimes these thoughts can just get stuck in our minds, these mental images concepts, maybe even songs or melodies that stick in your mind and replay over and over again. No matter what you do, you seemingly can't stop your mind from thinking of them in every undistracted moment. Perhaps you find your mind replaying the unwanted thought. Even after a good sleep, you wake up and the thought starts to play all over again. These thoughts are like a hamster running on a squeaky hamster wheel in the background. No matter what you're doing, that squeaky wheel always seems to be turning. Many become distraught and worry that their mind is stuck in a never-ending loop. Others fear that the loop could get worse and may never end. This anxiety symptom is often referred to as unwanted and repetitive thoughts. Some refer to it as obsessions or obsessional thinking. These stuck thoughts can cause anxiety symptoms, and they can be thought over and over again, or switch to another stuck thought, or change and shift between a variety of stuck thoughts. The stuck thought anxiety symptoms can come and go rarely, occur frequently, or persist indefinitely. They may proceed, accompany, or follow an escalation of of other anxiety sensations and symptoms, or occur by itself. Perhaps they accompany or follow an episode of nervousness, anxiety, fear, elevated stress, or occur out of the blue for no apparent reason whatsoever. They sometimes range from slight, moderate, to severe, or they can come in waves. They can change from day to day or moment to moment. Sometimes these stuck thoughts are referred to as earworms. So, why does anxiety cause these stuck thoughts? Well, there are many reasons why anxiety can cause stuck thoughts. Three main reasons are that stress adversely affects brain function. Stress taxes the body's energy resources harder than normal, and stress can impact and significantly reduce the quality of sleep, leaving you tired. Behaving anxiously activates the stress response. Because of the many changes this stress response brings about, it stresses the body, especially the nervous system, which includes your brain. When stress responses occur infrequently, the body can return to normal functioning easily. This results in few, if any, lingering negative effects. When they occur too frequently, however, such as from behaving overly anxiously or being stuck in a bad situation the body has a more difficult time recovering. This can result in the body remaining in a state of hyperstimulation since stress hormones are stimulants. In other words, 
behaving overly apprehensively can overstress the body. A body that becomes overly stressed can behave in odd ways. Regarding stuck thoughts, persistently elevated stress has a negative effect on brain function. Increased electrical activity in the brain will cause an increase in thought generation. They're here. This increased thought generation can cause thoughts to replay over and over again. They're here. Stress also heightens the activity in the amygdala, which is the fear center, and suppresses activity in the cortex, which is the rationalization area of the brain. This change can cause stuck thoughts to take on a more ominous tone, with a reduced ability to dismiss them. This combination alone can cause thoughts to seemingly become more stuck and insurmountable. Stress also taxes the body, its energy, and resources harder than normal. Overly apprehensive behavior can cause the body to become fatigued. Fatigue can affect brain function, as we all know, after not getting enough sleep or being overly exerted and then trying to think of something, to remember something, or to solve a problem. Many tired and anxious people experience stuck thoughts or unwanted thoughts. Stress can also impact and significantly reduce the quality of sleep, leaving you tired, which sounds like it may lead to a vicious cycle. If you don't get enough sleep, you become stressed. If you're stressed, you may not get enough sleep. Sleep deprivation is a common cause of tired thinking, which often includes stuck thoughts. Perhaps even just getting a good night's sleep can get rid of these stuck thoughts. Although, if you are like me, sometimes you have these stuck thoughts not because of a lack of sleep, but perhaps it's because of something that happened while you slept. In my case, and in many other cases as well, sometimes while we're sleeping, that's when our subconscious comes alive and brings forth these mental images and concepts and thoughts as dreams. And sometimes these dreams are of things that we don't want to think about or don't want to remember. Perhaps it's bad memories of traumatic experiences or of things that are unpleasant. Maybe they're realities that we don't ever want to come to fruition. In which case, dreaming about them and then waking up and thinking about it can affect the way that you behave throughout the day and your mood in general. Now, this isn't a pleasant thought. This is nothing that anybody wants to deal with, of course. But it's not something that we can control necessarily either. I mean, when we go to sleep... What happens next is completely up to our subconscious. We can't change that. But what we can change is how we respond to those thoughts. You can either choose to believe them and act on them, or you can choose to deal with them. And dealing with these unwanted thoughts is the only way you can succeed in getting rid of them. So for this part of the show, I would like to talk about a few things to help Clear your mind and get focused on the things that actually matter to you. Taking a mental break is important. Sometimes it's challenging to handle distracting thoughts. So here we're going to point out some tips that can help you quickly clear your mind and mental exercises that you can do wherever and whenever you need to. Things come up that will often disturb a peaceful state of mind. Some things are external, while others are self-imposed. In either case, the result is the same, a distracted mind. A mind cluttered with thoughts that creates tension in the body. It's not healthy to carry that type of mental anxiety around. We know that stress can be seriously detrimental, yet we still don't take time to do anything about it. Fortunately, we're going to take care of that right now, so that you can quickly handle these distracting thoughts and enjoy your day with a clear mind. Set aside a moment and give yourself permission to stop thinking. I know, if it were that easy, you would have done it already. But just try it and you'll be pleasantly surprised. Distracting thoughts are like a shadow. 
they are only projections that don't reflect the truth of reality. As such, they shouldn't be given too much attention. At some point, you decide that it was useful to consider such thoughts, but when they become burdensome, it's important to recognize them in order to set them aside. Right now, even if just for a moment, give yourself permission to give up distracting thoughts. It may seem silly, but I want you to actually give your brain the command, I'm not worried about anything right now. I just want to have a moment without unnecessary thoughts. Repeat this if necessary and take a couple of nice, deep breaths. Imagine yourself more relaxed. Start with the obvious before you get too deep into your imagination. Take a couple of deep breaths and have a stretch. After that, settle into a chair. Do a body scan starting from your feet. Progressively relax your muscles, focusing on tense areas, and end with loosening your neck and stretching your jaw. Now, when you're physically relaxed, imagine taking it one step further. You don't have to picture yourself in a sauna or hot tub for this to work. In fact, I want you to forget about being somewhere cozy and imagine being relaxed right where you are. You know that dealing with your situation, whatever it may be, will be easier if you're calm and focused. Recognize this and strive for a balance. Notice if there's effort leading to the creation of distracting thoughts. Where is the effort coming from? Withdraw effort from unhelpful thought processes. It can be difficult to do this when it seems like distracting thoughts simply appear on their own. That's why it is helpful to look at the underlying cause. Did you intentionally set out to think something over? Is there a reason you still have that topic in your mind that you're giving it attention, or can you safely focus all of your attention on something else? If you can bring your attention to some present task, then do that. Just start something, even something small, and let distractions fall into the background. Place your effort on whatever is at hand, and your thoughts will lose their power. Visualize your thoughts and simply watch as they pass by. A good visualization for this technique is to imagine your distracting thoughts as a train. Keep the term train of thought in mind. Each time a thought pops up, imagine it as a car on a train. Attach it to the train or throw it into a freight car and watch it go away. Take a step back and just watch the train pass. Let it go and your thoughts will go with it. Notice that it feels different to step back from mental chatter and simply observe rather than getting caught up in it. There is a distinct lack of effort involved. Notice the difference so you can apply this mental trick anytime it's helpful. This, too, shall pass. Whatever it is that's distracting you, remember it's just another moment in time. Like everything else, it's only temporary. See if you can focus on this characteristic of your experience. Take the experience as it comes and let go of everything else. Think of the opposite. It stands to reason that most distracting thoughts are negative and therefore have opposites. Simply reflect on the opposite, not just thinking about it, but feeling it as well. If you're angry, think of something happy, your favorite nephew or a happy place. Feel it with your whole body. The possibilities are endless. Try some physical movement. Research has shown that getting physical exercise can allow you to get out of your head. If possible, leave the situation you're in. Ask for a toilet break and go for a stretch. Or practice deep breathing. If it's not a pressing matter, you might take a longer break and go to the gym or get a sweat going. Or you could try some music even. Another good way to get rid of these distracting thoughts is to think of the misery it causes. With this technique, you go a bit deeper. Look past the thoughts and see what they're costing you. Really reflect on it. If you're distracted at work by anger from your morning argument, then see what it's costing you. Are you affecting your coworkers? Are you performing poorly? Are you endangering your job? Once you realize this, you resolve to stop thinking those thoughts. The distancing technique is also very simple. Just let your thoughts slide by without attaching to them. 
realize that the thoughts are just that, thoughts. They don't have any power beyond what you give them, and you don't have to believe them or act on them. Just acknowledge them. A good analogy would be to think of your mind as a large, blank, white screen. Your thoughts are ants scurrying across the screen. Don't judge them, analyze them, condemn them, or hate them. Just watch them run across the screen, in one end and out the other. If you prod and play with them, then they will lose their way and get stuck on the screen for a longer time than necessary. Physically throw away your negative thoughts. It may sound crazy, but clearing your head of nagging thoughts could be as easy as writing it down on a piece of paper and tossing it in the trash. People who write down negative things about their bodies and then throw them away have a more positive self-image a few minutes later compared to those who kept the papers with them. However you tag your thoughts as trash or as worthy of protection seems to make a difference in how you use those thoughts. You could try having a cup of tea. It sounds silly, but negative thoughts can occur for many different reasons. If yours are focused on feeling lonely, you may gain some comfort by warming up. Literally. Yale researchers discovered in 2012 that people recalled fewer negative feelings about a past lonely experience when they were holding a hot pack. They also found that lonely people tend to take longer hot showers. Oh, that's surprising. I love long hot showers. Substituting physical warmth for emotional warmth can be a quick fix. Just don't let that take place of real human interaction in the long run. Try reframing your situation. If your urge to ruminate is very strong, distracting yourself isn't going to be easy. So before you try it, it may be necessary to reframe or reappraise the situation in your head. If you get stuck in the airport for hours because of a canceled flight, for example, don't think of what you're missing out on. Instead, see it as a chance to get work done or to call your parents or an old friend. Once you've successfully reframed your situation, it may be easier to distract yourself with a visualization exercise like shopping lists or crossword puzzle or a quick stroll. And of course, my favorite tip of all, when all else fails, sometimes you just need to say fuck it. You are a human being, and it's not always possible to be in control. Knowing when to simply let go is valuable. It's humbling to realize that you can't control everything, but it is useful to remember. Saying fuck it does not mean that you have to abandon your responsibilities. It just means that you can safely let go of thoughts that hinder your present focus. When mental expectations are unmet, it can lead to anxiety and sometimes stress. If the results are weighing on you and affecting your present state then it's best to let them go. You have to recognize when holding on to your expectations is not benefiting you. Even if it feels like that mental effort is getting you somewhere, more than likely, it's not. It's like stepping on the gas pedal when you're stuck in a muddy ditch. Take your foot off the pedal and go for a walk instead. I bet you'll get further that way. This step, above all else, has been the most useful one to me in my everyday life. Sometimes I think about all of these negative feelings and, and memories, and of course you can't get rid of those. You can't just erase your mind like it's some sort of external hard drive, and you just click the delete button and those files go to the trash bin. No, you can't do that. You can't forget things. You can't make your brain be something that it's not. So sometimes you just have to say, fuck it, this is me. These are my memories, and although I have them, they are no longer important to me. So fuck them, and fuck my brain for trying to think about them right now when they are least important. It's very freeing and relaxing. Usually afterwards, I end up with a clear mind that's as still and peaceful as water. Perhaps this is something that could work for you. Sometimes we deal with things that are stronger than negative thoughts. They're more pervasive and more subtle as well. These are called mental distortions. 
There are three mental distortion, three main mental distortions that are nicely summed up by Martin Seligman in his work Learned Optimism. The first is called permanence. We think everything has a larger impact time-wise than it really does. We believe that a bad event will persist and continue to affect us. A permanent thinker checks the scales after a week of failed dieting and despairs. I will never be able to lose any weight. A temporary thinker thinks differently. I didn't lose any weight this past week, but that doesn't mean I won't in the future. The second distortion is called pervasiveness. We think that the consequences of an event will spill over into the rest of our lives. It has a larger impact space-wise than it really does. Bruce gets up to do a presentation at a big meeting, and he stutters in nervousness. If he was a healthy, specific thinker, he would have thought, I got nervous once at a business meeting. No big deal. If he was a pervasive thinker, he would have interpreted the situation as, I'm not a good speaker. I'm boring. Nobody wants to socialize with me. Oh my god, is that why L turned down a date with me? The third distortion is called personalization, which is taking everything personally. We see insults where none were meant, or we take blame for things that are not our fault. For instance, Madison and Clark bump into an old friend Peter on the street, but Peter pretends not to see them and walks right past. Madison takes it personally. She thinks Peter doesn't like her, or maybe she's done something to anger him. Clark, however, thinks that Peter was probably late for an appointment and didn't have time to chit-chat. So how do we catch these distortions? A good method of applying this knowledge would be the three-column method. You could write it down, but it's also easy enough to do mentally. Simply get into the habit of monitoring your thoughts. Once you catch a thought, write it down in the first column. Next to it, write down the distortion that you think may apply. And in the third column, write down a healthy interpretation, one without any distortions. The next time you catch yourself with a distorted thought, stop and replace it with your healthier interpretation. This is a skill that can be hard to master, but the results are worth it. Of course, if none of these strategies work for you, there is always something else that you can try. In this last group of techniques, simply involves forcing the thoughts to stop. The first such technique is the howitzer mantra. Prepare for a mantra that works for you. The howitzer refers to the fact that it has to be forceful. Examples of these are stop, enough, no more, or lies. The moment you catch yourself with an unwanted thought, interrupt the chain of thoughts with your forceful mental exclamation. Another version is to wear a rubber band around your wrist. Every time you catch yourself with a thought you don't want, snap the band. It hurts a little, sure, but you're conditioning your system with mild punishment to realize that these thoughts can hurt you. Eventually, these conditioning methods will cause the thoughts to die down. So hopefully you found something in these methods that can help you to get rid of these distortions or these mental thoughts that keep repeating that you don't want to hear. I think that we all understand how loud our thoughts can be in our own head at times, and there are moments in life where we need to face those thoughts, and also moments in life when we need those thoughts to go away. The trick to being a mentally healthy individual is to knowing when it is important to face and analyze those thoughts, and when it is time to put those thoughts to rest. Now, I know that there is nothing that we can really do to solve all of our problems, but hopefully this is a step in the right direction for most of you. I know that some of these techniques have been helpful to me, and... I feel as if I'm a better person once I've gotten rid of my negative thoughts because not only do they make me feel bad, but they make me feel badly about myself. And that is something that nobody should have to go through. If other people love you, then you should be able to find reasons to love yourself, even in times when you feel that you are struggling. Know that you deserve the best. 
and allow yourself to have the best. Don't waste time with anything less than that. Well, I think that about wraps it up for this session. I hope you all now feel more familiar with the white bear syndrome and perhaps that can be a fun game that you can play with some of your friends. Perhaps you can make your own experiment and try it out. And if you do, by the way, let me know how it goes. Email me at illuminationhour at gmail.com. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the Illumination Hour. We'll see you again next week. What can we say to convince you to take all of the boundaries down, to stop limiting what you believe can be yours? If there is anything we wish to achieve, it is to have each of you boundless and free. Knowing that every thought you entertain somehow determines your experience. Begin to believe that you are always at the right place at the right time. If you ask us how much time you need to devote to this, we will say, it's very simple, all of your time. Thought you entertain somehow determines your experience.